I've been active in the lean startup um, movement since 2009. Uh, frequent contributor, there's a, there's a Google group, there's an LSC mailing list, and then there's a LinkedIn group, they're quite active. I'm one of the moderators for the Lean Startup Wiki. Um, I've been a mentor at the Lean Startup Conference the last four years. And uh, by day, I advise a number of entrepreneurs on uh, using these techniques, in particular for new product introduction. So we want to cover four primary topics tonight. One is why companies use Lean for innovation. Two, what is Lean? Three, where do Lean startup methods help the most? And then four, we're going to run through a collection of about um, four key concepts in some detail. Companies are using Lean because they're focused on learning, right? And if you're learning faster than your competition, you're able to more effectively allocate resources, you're more responsive to your customer needs, and you're able to reduce your development time, get into the market faster. You don't have to be as accurate in terms of your project projections, your forecasts, if you're getting into the market sooner, right? If you're getting real feedback on real products, then you don't have to be as smart. Here's three um, fairly well-known examples of, of teams that are using Lean. So Intuit, for their SnapTax product, they targeted the, the um, simple filer, and they ruthlessly pruned the feature set until essentially you could take a picture with your camera and get your taxes filed in one day. And they did that by focusing on that customer and what it was going to take. Aardvark was a um, expertise location service that was acquired by Google. They looked at helping people answer questions and locate experts. That's a very complicated workflow. They started out by essentially doing it all by hand, using text chat and spreadsheets to figure out what the real workflow process could be. And by doing that, they didn't get committed to a particular architecture until they really understood the problem. And then I think folks have heard of Dropbox. The, the, um, the, the, the video is presented as an MVP. The, their first product actually hit it out of the park in terms of what people could pay for, was, was had enough features but was simple enough that you could turn it on and get started. And they've, they've, I, I, they've been quite successful. A lot of other startups that are using it. Um, these are folks that we're working with um, in a wide, wide range of areas. So when you think about experimentation and experimentation being driven by hypotheses, what we're talking about with Lean is taking business hypotheses and crafting experiments to either prove or disprove them. <coughs> this is a scientific approach to both creating a product and launching a new business. It positions the development of customers and customer relationships in parallel with the development of the product. So you're doing both of these at the same time. It relies on iterative product releases and focuses on reduced waste to speed learning. Deliver and develop just what the customer needs. Make sure that they're actually going to pull it from you as opposed to theorizing what, it might, what they might need. So the, the, the genesis of Lean Startup um, focused primarily on software startups. Steve Blank wrote a book in uh, 2003 that was his look back over eight startups, some that had been successful, some that had failed. He called it Four Steps to the Epiphany. He saw a common set of patterns and how the successful ones had done development that was not the way people typically talked about it. They didn't talk about the iteration. They didn't talk about the need to get out of the building and talk to customers early. Startups were acting like um, large companies that were small as opposed to nimble companies. And so that's the, that's the genesis. Eric Reese was a student of his and then Blank advised him on one of his startups. He started blogging in 2008 on a web, on a web blog called Startup Lessons Learned. Um, became very popular. There was a series of conferences that, that um, started out being called Startup Lessons Learned. They're now called the Lean Startup Conference. And he uh, wrote a book in 2011 called The Lean Startup. 
Question? Yes. Uh, is this kind of guaranteed to make something small uh, and not a, a healthcare website or an FAA program or something like that? This is so GE has presented at the Lean Startup Conference of how they use these techniques for the design of new jet engines. Now, their idea of what a lean jet engine looks like it's pretty substantial. But there are other techniques, especially for hardware, that involve the use of simulation, the use of mock-ups and prototypes to get customers to assess, is this going to be a fit with my needs? So it, it does work for hardware, and it does work for complex products. Um, it's, it's been popularized for software. But um, the healthcare.gov thing is a little different issue. That's, that's more of a, a set of requirements that were baked into regulation and law, there's not much wiggle room in that, right? So that, by definition, is almost a waterfall project because the, the things aren't going to move. Um, GE's got different problems in designing complex medical equipment or jet engines where they need to understand how do they actually improve the radiologist's workflow or what does Boeing want to pay for in 2020. Question? Do you see this descending from a uh, Toyota production system, or is this something different in your mind? No, I think, I, so the roots go back probably to the 30s. Br British car companies had a pull model. Toyota certainly developed in the 80s. Um, to the extent that you're looking at pull models, having the customers pull product into their hands as opposed to building to stock, it's that same kind of concept. So yeah, it, 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 the, the term lean does tie to lean manufacturing. And we'll use some other terms from lean manufacturing as we go through. So this tends, lean startup methods tend to help most in three areas. One is emerging markets, new markets where, where requirements are unstable, it's not clear exactly what's going on. Two, industries that are being disrupted, industries where new technologies, new entrants are coming in and changing the rules. And third, in particular companies that discover they've fallen behind the innovation curve and they have to learn faster than their competitors if they hope to catch up. So in all three cases, the, the reward is on learning faster than your competitors, and that's what these methods are designed to do. We picked a representative sample of some areas we see these things being used. There are, uh, in global product teams and global supply chains, you see a big focus on lean, a number of software-enabled services. If you look at what's happening in, in journalism and in education, business models are very much in flux. Right? It's not clear that the modern university is going to survive till 2030 in the way, that's, the way we're currently funding it and operating it. Media is undergoing quite a bit of disruption. And then new, new areas like big data are getting applied to a variety of fields. It's not clear where that ends up either. So I want to cover four key concepts that are associated with lean and lean startup. The first is the build, measure, learn loop. The second is the concept of a minimum viable product. The third is the concept of pivoting. And the fourth, the fourth is my spin on the need to go and look at things, which we call get out of the bat cave. We work primarily with early stage firms, and they don't have buildings. They have kind of co-working facilities or a corner of a desk somewhere, so it's more appropriate for them. This is the core process feedback loop that Lean Startup follows. This is straight out of Eric's book. Uh, it's called the Build, Measure, Learn loop. Typically, you start by building something as a provocation. You release that as a product. You measure the impact, either in the customer or in the ability to gather interest in it. You look at that data. You may experience surprise, some sadness. <laughs> you learn from that. <laughs> you feed that back into the next iteration of the product. And so this is a loop you're going through um, to maximize the amount you're learning. It's not necessarily moving through it as fast as possible as much as picking experiments that, that do the most to reduce your level of uncertainty where the unknowns are. So we use this, we tend to advise people to start with measure. There's almost always a status quo there's almost always a set of incumbent solutions. There are, there are alternatives available to your customers. Start with understanding what that is before you go build your own thing. From that, you can extract data. Often you can also extract stories, narrative, anecdotes that are equally useful. 
You can then use that to develop ideas for what you're going to build and then enter the market with a better understanding of what the landscape looks like. Same loop, just a different start. Question? Yes, um, on your previous slide, um, there are a number of, I guess there's software development methodologies, test-driven development, agile, and all of its many things. Is everything around that just all in the build circle? So this definitely follows an agile development model. I mean, there may be differences in some of the details, right? Kanban systems look at the same thing. They're pulling feature requests or working to a short queue. I think, I think I'm, I'm not sure the differences are all that important. The focus in Lean is, is reducing uncertainty in what you're trying to learn, right? So you're really trying to minimize. It, it's got a bigger focus on market risk or misfit in the customer's expectations. But, but many products also face substantial development risk, and these techniques work to also, in parallel, address development risk. Blank, for many years, talked about the fact that if you had a cure for cancer, you didn't need to do this, and it turns out you do. He's now working with National Science Foundation to help people launch new cures, because most, most early cancer cures are quite toxic, right? Figuring out how you can actually get them worthwhile and who they're going to most benefit is, is a hard problem. Next concept is called the minimum viable product. And there's a lot of, a lot of um, discussion about this. We're, I'm going to present a particular approach that is um, very appropriate for B2B startups. Um, this is a strategy that, that allows you to formalize the key hypothesis about the product and take that out to explore what the market's going to require. In particular, it's very difficult to explore pricing without actually making offers to people. But asking somebody a question, will you pay for this, turns out to have very poor predictive value in terms of what's going on. And that tends to be where, for startups, a lot of products fail. A lot of people tell them it's a great product and they can see themselves using it. Nobody actually writes a check. So let's take Lego as a hypothetical. They're curious, can we launch a new line of kits that are aimed at the Star Wars universe? Right? We've got pirates, we've got dragons, we've got wizards, we've got European towns. <coughs> And you can imagine someone that put that plan together said, let's build the Death Star, right? That's where most of two movies take place. A whole bunch of, of very memorable scenes take place. Let's make that possible. But if the test they're really trying to determine is, is there interest in Lego-themed Star Wars? Starting off on the, left, on the left with a smaller kit may only cost 12 bucks as opposed to 400 on the right. It allows them to assess. Will parents pay for this? Do kids want to play, play with it? And you can build this up. And so the point here is not that you can't have the vision for building out the full product, building out the full Death Star, but think about ways you might test, is there market interest? Is there consumer interest? I have a question? Sure. So if the product on the left sells, what does it say about whether the product on the right will sell? Well, there might be several steps between the product on the left and the product on the right. But if the product on the left doesn't sell, probably the product on the right is in for some very tough sledding. Right? If the kids all want to play with pirates this year and don't want to play with spaceships, there's no point in building a Death Star. Yeah, but the, on the left, might be too small. There is a, there is a risk that it, that, it, that it lacks some minimum desirability. Right, but but that's a kit with seventy-four pieces. It's not, it's not like a minifig. No, I mean right. about MVP. It's too small. It's really too small uh, feature. The trick, the trick is to is to have a few key features that allow you to test: is there going to be a market for the full product? Right. That is a risk. We're going, to spend, we're going to look at this slide a couple of ways. So um, th this is the definition that we like to use, <clears throat> in particular for B2B markets. So we define an MVP as an offering for sale, 
of a product or service for a particular type of customer with a specific problem of enough severity that provides enough value to justify an initial purchase. And this actually encapsulates a number of key hypotheses that you normally have to manage about a new product introduction. Who's the customer? What's the problem of the job to be done that you're going to get hired to solve for them? Do they view that as important enough to actually talk to you or pay attention? How are you going to provide, package? What's the feature content of what you're going to do? Are they going to view that as having enough value? Is that going to be enough value that they'll actually make an initial purchase from you? So these, these six kind of variables divide into two parts. Three things that are under your control in launching the product, and three things that are determined by the customer. You get to pick the customer you're going to focus on. You get to pick the problem that you're going to try and diagnose or determine that they have and dive in on. And you get to pick the feature content, how you're going to figure it, how you're going to provision it, how you're going to deliver it. The customer determines, the customer you select determines, is this a problem that I care enough about or a job to be done that I care enough about to actually have a conversation with you or to pay attention to what you're telling me. They look at what you're promising as a solution, they compare it to other available alternatives that they have and see if it provides enough value that they would actually spend time and then money on it. So when we talk about pivots, we talk about changing these three items. We don't talk about compromising your vision. We talk about, are we talking to the right customer? Should we narrow our focus? Should we look a little laterally? Are we talking about the right problem that this customer's got? Are we talking about a problem that they're going to normally say, this is a critical problem for me? And finally, are we configuring, packaging, delivering something that's got enough functionality that they're going to view it has value. There are, there are long lists of different kinds of pivots. Most of them for new product introduction <coughs> boil down to these three kinds of problems. Right? Who's the customer? What's the problem you're going to solve for them? What's the nature of the solution that's going to provide enough value? Let me take you through an extended example of um, a firm we've worked with for a couple years now. They're in the cellular expense control industry. They work with businesses and they help them manage cell phone plans, save money on cell phone plans. Their first MVP was actually a spreadsheet they developed to provide structure, checklists, and a way to help their customers evaluate cell phone plans for lowest cost. They made their money in the switch to a new carrier. They then realized that people would pay them to watch the bills every month. And so they migrated from a spreadsheet to a QuickBase application and said, okay, let's help manage the spend. Let's scan the PDFs and let's manage the spend. They started out focusing on any business and they realized as they moved to managing the spend, there had to be order of magnitude 300 devices so there was enough of a line item expense that somebody actually care about managing it, right? Finally, they said, let's actually not only manage the spend, let's help manage the move ad change for companies that are managing multiple vendors that have multiple carriers. So they created a common portal. And at the same time, they realized we should, we should narrow our focus on construction companies. Construction companies, a substantial fraction of their IT infrastructure is actually the mobile. Because they, they go to where the work is, they work, and then they go somewhere else. So they're working in, in very, not very rudimentary conditions where the mobile infrastructure is the only thing that typically spans out there. Question? No, sir. So, yes. um, the, uh, the spreadsheet, was that viewed as an experiment or that was viewed so, as no, a, each, a each, minimum viable product? Each one of these they took money on and got paid for. So they proceeded because they had people, so they were codifying their knowledge and they, and they, they, they said, okay, we've actually got something here that's complex enough that it's worth doing as a spreadsheet. People will pay us for it. And that allowed them to write the spec for the quick case. And then that allowed them to evolve that to the spec for the full, full stack that also managed to spend. But each one of these were products that they sold. 
or, or the first was actually a service offer. The critical for construction. So, so they they, they learned that, that that companies that have um, <clears throat> forces that are often in the field, pharmaceutical sales teams, um, service companies that provide remote repair, logistics, these kind of things, where, where the, most of the infrastructure is actually mobile, are much more focused on making sure that infrastructure is reliable, available, and at the lowest cost possible. Right? If you if you have mainly a desk bound workforce. Then you've got a lot of other you've got a date you've got other things that you're doing, right? So this was a so this was a it might have been smaller span compared to bigger companies, but it was a bigger problem for those companies. We work primarily with teams of scientists and engineers, and the temptation is to try and build the Death Star first to kind of over engineer the MVP. And the challenge is not that the vision is incorrect. The challenge is how do you actually start to gather proof that there's going to be a market for what you're working on, not having to wait 18 months to get there, right? So one progression that we see that, that's pretty effective is to start with a service, look at a system integration of other off-the-shelf tools, and then finally add your own full-blown product. One challenge to consider is what could you offer in two weeks? What could you do to get started? So can you offer an audit to determine, is this really a problem for the customer? Is the customer interested in learning more about how severe a problem is this for me? Can you, can you sell informational products? Can you sell workshops, webinars, eBooks that talk about this problem? If it's a serious enough problem, then you'll get interest. For those of you that are in larger firms, or that are planning to compete with larger firms, Figure out what's going on on the hotline. What are the problems the support people are facing? What are the common workarounds that the professional service teams are having to implement around the product? And if they're playing on your team, figure out how you can augment what they're doing. If you're planning to play against them, figure out how you can take advantage of that. Question? I guess the risk in this approach is that you're essentially doing market research for a larger competitor to, that could take your nice MVP and quickly outstrip you in terms of what they can offer to that uh, uh, market that you just identified. So to the extent that you don't brag about how successful you're going to be and, and you start by attacking the less well-served or the less desirable companies of the large firm, I mean, there's clearly a risk for that. The, the people that tend to get run over you know, give the finger to the big competitor and go, you know, we're going to take your market from you, right? And, and it's good to have ambition, but um, a certain amount of circumspection is probably called for. Normally, normally, if you're not targeting their first tier accounts, you look like you're solving some side problem that's not particularly attractive. Most, most, you get into a hurdle rate problem where it's hard for a large company to launch a small product, right? Because the mechanisms, the ways that they manage a large product and a new product it's hard, it's hard to span that, right? If you're not going after a billion dollar market, you know, they don't want to hear about it at the exec ops review every month, right? But it is a risk. The final thing you do is think about what's the result you could sell the prospect. Is there something you could do for them? Instead of saying, you know, why don't you buy this drill? Say, you know, I'll put four holes in the wall, where do you want them? And if they'll pay by the hole, then that's evidence that some people may buy drills. And this is also called the Wizard of Oz or the concierge model where you, where you in a service, service model, you, you emulate what your product is ultimately going to do. Maybe, maybe you've actually got a version of the product, but it's better that nobody else actually touches it. Maybe you should just touch it and keep the sharp edges away from prospects. Right? The jagged edges of tomorrow. So let's look a little bit at testing an MVP. There are, there are a number of techniques that are commonly used. Um, most people go into science and engineering because they like to work on hard problems, and um, interviewing people wasn't high on their list. So they tend to gravitate to 
these web and email methods, surveys, A-B testing, split testing, multivariate testing, where you're presenting different versions of a web page or of a landing page. The problem is it's hard to be surprised by most of those tests. You only get the answers back that you're asking for. And if you're far enough away from a real solution, it just you, you get silence, right? You, you just get silence. Another thing to pay attention to as you start to gain some traction is cohort analysis. As you're talking to customers, make sure you understand where are they in the adoption of your product. Because there's going to be teething problems, there's going to be the first use problems, there's going to be scale-up problems. And so, so sorting what the use model looks like by their maturity with your offering is an important way of understanding the feedback that they're giving you. And then there are, there are conversational or ethnographic methods. Um, how many folks have heard of appreciative inquiry? It's, it's, it's been around for, I don't know, 20 years now. Essentially, it says, instead of assuming that you're smarter than the customer, assume that they've actually got a business or an organization that's viable and figure out what they're doing right and then what they view as the problems. Right? And that means that you go and you observe, you listen. The other, the other thing uh, is when you're looking at their current methods, Trying to get to root cause or five whys is a way to determine where are their real opportunities. Right. Five, so asking why repeatedly to get to the root of a problem. This is a lean, a lean buzzword, five whys, I'm sorry. This, this five whys is also, happy, is, is also um, helpful when your own product isn't working. Question? You have an example of your five whys? So, That's a good question. O often the, the, um, the, the initial presentation of a problem is not where the problem actually started, right? And so reacting to the surface problem that's presented may not get to what's actually triggering what's going on. I don't actually have a good one on the top of my head, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. Oh, the coffee filter. So, 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 you, so you, 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 know, you go to get coffee and you can't make coffee because there's no coffee filter. So why didn't they get ordered? Well, our order process is we have stickies we put in the back of the uh, closet and we're out of stickies. Well, okay, so why, why are we out of stickies? Okay, so and then all of a sudden you're kind of three or four levels down. Or maybe, maybe they didn't make a trip this, this week because they got busy with something else. Right? So sometimes you have cascading failures to get to where the real root causes. So I'll start at the bottom with the lean. So the, the, the lean talks about debugging problems in manufacturing. You go and see. You go to the gimbal. You go to the scene of the crime. And this is the same thing you want to do in talking to customers, right? Blank, blank popularized. This is get out of the building. Um, Give them a sense for? Scene of the crime. Uh, it's Japanese for scene of the crime. In sorry. What language? Uh, Japanese. Japanese for scene of the crime. All the all the lean the Toyota guys put lean names on all the stuff, or put Japanese names on it. So, so you'll hear you'll see go and see or go to the Gemba in the lean manufacturing piece. Um, it's the same thing as saying get out of your own building, get out of the, don't don't become trapped in your own assumptions. Actually, go and look at what's going on. Listen to what the customer's telling you have conversations. It's hard to really learn anything if you just stay in your office. This is, uh, these are some key points I took away from a talk by Scott Cook uh, at last year's Lean Startup Conference on, on how leaders create a culture of innovation. This is important both in startups and in larger firms. The, the first is to anchor the team's focus on the problem, not your idea for how it should be solved, right? The second is make sure that you're getting the most amount of creativity and diversity of thought you can. So you're empowering new employees to run experiments, you're lowering the cost to build your run experiments, and you're shortening the amount of time it takes to do experiments. And, and this last, um, this last one, I, I, I those of you working in large firms, when they say, savor the surprise of a negative experience, that's it's interesting coming from the CEO. Right? When was the last time somebody in a large firm said, we, we really are enjoying the fact that we completely blew this, right? that that didn't work. But in fact, 
if you're really trying to learn, most of your experiments are going to have about a 50-50 chance of succeeding or, or not. If you're running things that are sure things to work, you're not really learning that much. Right? So you tend to want to move closer to the edge of failure. If they've only got a 1% chance of working, that's the same mistake as if they have 99% chance of working. So a lot of times the things you try don't work. If you're engaging conversations, they don't work in useful ways you can extract information from. So we've talked about why companies use Lean for innovation. We've talked a little bit about what is Lean, where do Lean startup methods help the most. And we covered four key concepts. The build, measure, learn loop, minimum viable product, pivoting, and the importance of getting out of the back cave. I'll take questions on this. Question. So uh, you're, you're talking to customers, startups, you find that they have I mean, both the interest, but even more importantly, the money to uh, you know, spend on your yeah. yeah, we work with bootstrappers. We, our process, we work with anywhere from 16 to 24 firms at a time. And they, um, I understand the top, how taking orders could work, but, but you know, the Typically, a, a, some a services like yours are typically very expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. probably not as. I mean, I, I, so we are we we orient towards businesses that are doing anywhere from zero to a million, two million dollars a year, and their idea of a budget for this is very different from a Fortune 500 company. We've done some work with Fortune 500 companies, but we don't drive the practice to sell to the Fortune 500. We use a lot of virtual collaboration techniques. We, half of our clients are out of region. We actually don't meet them. We do virtual meetings with them. We do conversations. We help them run tests online. We'll do webinars together. We'll go on remote sales calls together. A few drops of insight doesn't take a lot of time necessarily. Question in the back. How do you avoid a situation where your minimum viable product becomes a not quite viable product? I, you know, I think sometimes you fall into that. Sometimes people say, this is two-thirds of a good product, but until it does this, I can't justify it. So that's, that's a not uncommon outcome. That's true for products you spend 18 months on, too, by the way. If you got to learning that pretty fast, that was valuable. Right, right. So if you can learn that in a few weeks to a few months, then you've still got runway left to, to do more. It's, it's the... the, the t the trick is to figure out what's really going to move the needle. When you t when you look at, when most people think about in a business setting buying a product, there's only a few reasons they're going to buy, right? They don't they don't I mean they may give long lists of requirements, so that's a side effect sometimes of a of a of a purchasing process. It's not really how the decision gets made, right? They're typically looking to solve some kind of critical problem, and they need one, two, or three capabilities to make that happen. Right? I mean, the interesting thing about Dropbox is they came in and they were actually substantially simpler than most of their competitors for backup. And that turned out to be a plus, not a minus. Question? Yes. With, uh, you mentioned you do some large firms. Uh, with them, is, are you typically after a whole new product that they're going to make or uh, adding a feature? Something so, so a lot of times they've introduced a product that's not meeting their revenue targets. And so we look at are we talking to the wrong customer? Do we have the wrong message? Right? Those are the two cheaper solutions. Then ultimately, do we have to add features? Right? So, but our focus tends to be, we go back to that MVP say, maybe we've got a good product here, we're just talking to the wrong people. Right? Or maybe we the beginning of the product, it's somewhere after they built one copy and now... Typically, yes. Copy. In terms of when we get called in, typically, yes. They've, they've, they, haven't, they haven't hit the targets they thought they would hit. Question? So driving lean in a, in a large company that has an established culture can, can be a difficult thing. It's a cultural change. What do, what do you think uh, uh, is the primary, are the primary factors that would enable that to succeed, and what do you think are the biggest barriers? So we're very big fans of kind of small wins approach. Carl Weick's got this small wins model. You, 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 pick, you, you pick things that you can do the change constraints that catalyze for the change. I think too often, people trying to announce a big change program, right, 
And, and what typically sells inside, inside the company is you get momentum, you get some small successes, and, and it's less about evangelizing lean as here's three things we're doing differently this time. I think sometimes people get too hung up on, on putting the label on it as opposed to what if we made this change. In that situation in particular, starting with measure, looking at post-mortems or products or projects that have failed and say, next time let's try that, there's less argument there if you can point at shortcomings or, or potholes you've stepped in, right? It's, it's, it's easier to kind of catch products or projects at the end for the post-mortem to, to then lay the groundwork for the new one. The problem when a new project gets chartered, if you're coming to a new project that's been chartered and they're two months, three months in, they got timelines, they got commitments, they, they're blessed with enormous optimism, right? It's very hard to deflect people in that mode. So it's, it's the same problem that most change management, cultural change initiatives have to surmount, which is, which is small wins and a, and a more of a percolation or influence model. Question? So when, when you go in and you help a, a startup and uh, provide a successful conclusion to some program they're running, do they take it on themselves to do the next one? or? In other words, do, do the lessons get to them and they understand more about the process and do they do business differently or do they fall back into a You know, I, I think it's all over the map. I think, um, I think it's all over the map. I, the, many entrepreneurs, like many people in large companies, are blessed with self-confidence. They, they know how they want to do it. Um, so we work very transparently. We're, we're working in, in workspaces where there's no kind of behind the curtain. There's a lot of improv and a lot of a lot of working up front. Our goal is to transfer the capability to the small teams, right? So, so some get it. Sometimes they teach us things mm -hmm. too, right? So it's not always going it's not always going one way, right? A lot of the distance collaboration things that we've learned have been by working with global teams that were already good at that. Um, I don't think this I don't think this is a um, this is more of a red queen race where. You're always having to be to be learning, right? Um, Heilmeyer, uh, George Heilmeyer, who was part of DARPA and who was one of the one of the guys that helped discover liquid crystal displays, and watched his entire effort get snuffed out of the RCA, right? RCA fumbled that market. He said, you know, a successful new project is a small group of talented people overcoming a larger, better funded group of talented people, and that's what's true either in a new initiative inside of a large company or in a startup, right? There's just a premium on execution. I want to thank you all for coming. I'll stick around afterwards. I think there's more pizza and bananas in the back. Mm -hmm. And we'll call it a game. <laughs>